Hi everybody, welcome to Beecraft Live and previously known as Beecraft Hangout, um, but we've changed the name now. Um, we've moved over from uh, Hangout to YouTube live events. Thank you for joining us tonight. And the topic this evening is going to be uh, on feeding and preparing your bees for winter. And we've got an expert panel of uh, people with us. We've got Claire Waring, the editor of Bee Crafts, and also, hi Claire, and also the author of Feeding Your Bees, which is the article on page 14 in September's issue. So, and we've also got Richard Rickett with us, deputy editor of Bee Craft, and Wendy Dale, our marketing manager as well. And hello, my name's Claire, and I'm part of the digital team for Bee Craft. So thank you. And we've got, um, we've had loads of great questions coming in so far and feel free to send in some more. Um, we're, we're here for about an hour, but you can submit questions live and we'll try and keep an eye on those as we go along. We're going to start with a question from Elaine Robinson and thank you, Elaine. You sent a couple of questions in and you, you're uh, a beginner beekeeper, just like myself. So I'm sure your question will help lots of other people. Um, and you've, you, you've, you've kind of got a few questions in one, but I'll just kick off by reading the first, the first part of it. After treating with Varroa, how long after would you expect mites to start to stop dropping that have been killed by the treatment? I'm using max strips on one hive and Apigard on another and monitoring the drops. So, we, Claire, would you like to start with, with Elaine's query on? Yeah, well, um... It depends really on the treatment, you know, the different treatments work in different ways and at different rates. So um, in, if you're using something like Apistan, which I know you're not, but Apistan is, is one of the treatments that will give you a very quick drop down. You know, you'll get a lot of mites dropping in the first, say, 24 hours. Um, but if you're using something like Apigard, as you are, it's a, a thymol treatment and it's much, well, it, it's it's slower to take effect. It's not, um, it is as effective, but the treatment is just different. It's uh, the way it works is different. So really what you've got to do is to follow the manufacturer's instructions on whichever treatment you're using. So if it says leave it in for six weeks, leave it in for six weeks and then take it out because if you leave these treatments in i mean i know some people will say oh well if you leave it in for 12 weeks it's twice as effective it's not true if you leave it in for 12 weeks or a long time the chances are that the mites will the ones they will some of them will survive and they will start getting resistant to that treatment this is what happened with apistan and bavarol when we first had for and when we first started treating um, that people thought, oh yes, I'll leave it in, I'll leave it in a long time, and some people just left it in permanently. Um, and then we started to get resistant mites. Um, and then that meant that Apistan and Bavarol were nowhere near as effective as they should be. Um, because if you're resistant to something, you don't die from it. Um, so really what you've got to do is to make sure that you read the instructions and then follow the instructions don't read the instructions and think you know better than the pe people who've done the all the testing and the development on these products because you have you don't they have done what is required by the um, veterinary medicines directorate and the other the other legislative bodies and they have done the testing as required and this means that what they say if you need to leave it in for six weeks, eight weeks, whatever the length of time is, that is the most effective treatment time. So you really do need to follow the instructions. Um, six weeks gets an effect over two brood cycles. If you think of the worker bees, the, um, from egg to adult is about 21 days. So that's about three weeks. So t six weeks, you've got two cycles of brood and you've you're so you're attacking the mites as they come out on the developing the bees that have just hatched and that's when you want to catch them so um right. i understand from from vita europe that with apigard 
even once you've removed the trays, the thymol is still active in the colony for a further couple of weeks. So you may see mites fall falling for some time after you've taken the um, Apigard trays out. But really the message is do what the instructions say. Thank you, Claire. Um, because Elaine also asks, what's the panel's view on diluted in IPA into feed and the use of Vita feed gold to help protect against nosema? Elaine said she had one colony in the summer diagnosed and wants to give them the best chance of getting through the winter. Well, the best thing really, if you if you you know you've got, I mean, let's let's start from the beginning. Most colonies have some nosema spores in them. Um, they did some work at Rothamsted a long time ago and um, actually found that there was nosema in essentially every colony. But if you've only got sort of a few spores, or uh, then you know it's the colony is not going to be affected. Um, uh, oh, I've lost my train, train of thought, sorry. Well, that's okay, Claire. I was just going to read Stephen, um, our <laughs> deputy editor as well, has replied really kindly by email um, saying to use thymol that is not part of an authorised treatment is risky. You have no precise control over the quantity of ingredient or quality, so results will be unpredictable. The suppliers say that Vitafeed Gold strengthens honeybee colonies by stimulating brood population in a controlled manner and it's best applied in spring or autumn after the supers have been removed okay so yeah is there anyone I mean, got sorry I'm, i don't want to hog this but um no, that, go for it. what stephen's point is that if you just think oh well i'll add a couple of teaspoons of thymol or whatever um or half a half a pound or, or whatever you think you don't know exactly what you're going to be doing to the to the um, colony whereas if you're using something like apigard or one of the other thymol treatments the as i said before the manufacturers have actually tested this and they know the dose that you you need to get the best effect so just adding random treatments thymol or anything else um really is is not a good idea because you just you don't know whether you're actually putting enough in to to kill the bro or you're putting too much in yeah that makes absolute sense richard or wendy do you, you have anything you want to add on that or um no only that i have used vice of feed gold in, in um, the spring we have found it to be very useful in colonies which in the previous year uh had Mozina and I um, mm. went to home and what have you. Um, mm. uh, I didn't do it in a, a way where I used a control colony or anything, but the colony, the colony had had in the spring did um, build up very rapidly and didn't have any more problems with Mozina. So, um, you're, you're not very loud, Richard. I don't know if you can get close to the microphone or shout yeah, a bit more. It is slightly quiet, and then if the rest of us, we can mute ourselves as well just to remove any background noise uh, well the gist of what i was saying was that i have i have used light feet of gold in colonies uh, that have had issues with nosema the following summer so i've used it in the spring so in the summer okay. before i um changed the comb and um, just shook form on them um, and then i used flight of feed um, in the following spring um and those colonies built up very nicely and didn't have any other problems i, I wasn't doing it in the control but i didn't have a control co uh, colony so i wasn't able to compare using it in one colony and not in another, but the colonies that I did use it in uh, did do very, very well indeed. Okay. Did you hear that? Was it loud enough? I, I did, yeah. Is that a, hang on, make sure I've not muted myself. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I don't know if I'm muted or not. I, can hear I, I could hear you. <laughs> um, thank you, Richard. Um, I've lo we've lost Wendy from the panel. I'm not sure where Wendy's gone. Hopefully she'll be back. Um, but I, 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 I guess as well, questions it's probably worth asking if Claire Richard have you started to feed your own colonies now and put them to bed for winter or not uh, off to you Richard uh, okay. <laughs> mine are very active at the moment um, it's been warm and there's a lot of ivy flowering and I think that probably flowering for another I was looking at the ivy today and there's a lot that hasn't come out yet so I think another two or three weeks um, I'm also 
feeding them at the same time, which I do each year with heavy syrup at the same time as the ivy, um, in an attempt not to have 100% ivy mm. um, in the cone. Um, and that seems to work. <clears throat> Sometimes, some colonies, in fact, um, don't touch syrup. They just prefer to go out and get what's natural. They find the ivy and they bring that in and they won't touch the syrup at the same time. Um, and um, the only issues I really have with a lot of ivy is um, early in the spring, if there's nowhere for the queen to lay. So I will sometimes move combs around with them or what have you in the spring. Um, so there is some room for queen to lay. <clears throat> but I, haven't, I don't experience other problems with, with ivy. I know some people really dislike mm. it. Yeah, the mm. ivy is just coming out here. Um, mm. I'm in the Midlands. Um, Richard's down in Mamola, wherever, he, wherever he's down Wiltshire. <laughs> mm. <I'm in> <laughs> uh, Our ivy has been out for at least a week. Yeah. Now, as as is just coming. I, in fact, I was near the gate um, the other day, and I thought, oh gosh, surely there's not a swarm at this time of year. Mm. And it was the it was the bees on the ivy. Yeah. Um, I went for a walk the other day and just had this obviously like a swarm noise and looked up and it was ivy all over a tree it's just yeah. they were they were loving it yeah 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 there is a there is it can be a problem with ivy honey as richard says because it, it can be like oil seed rate and go very hard um so they do need water in the in this well throughout the winter to actually use it um we tend to leave honey on the hive rather than feeding um so you know, as as have a well, have a, a super or at least a good amount of honey um, for their stores, um, and then in the winter, if they if they are getting light, then I will give them a block of candy. Okay. But it's a different way of different way of managing the bees. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, I'm still on Elaine's questions. Um, she says, and Richard's kindly answered this one, I've, I've got a lot of comb and honey mixture left from a bit of honey extraction. Sticky mess, there's lots of heather in the honey. I've put it in a large Tupperware tub. Can I just put this above the crown board for the bees to lick any honey from? And do I need to spread it out or is it okay in one big lump? Stevens um, said, take it down more quickly and to decrease the energy that they need to take it down, that spreading it is a good idea, but to be careful that it's not so sticky that the bees get trapped in it and die. Is that the kind of the same advice that you'd offer, Elaine? Um, yeah, well, you, you, I mean, you can do that, or if, if it is really sticky, then, you know, you can turn it into syrup, um, but it's a bit late to be, be feeding syrup probably get away with it if the if the weather's reasonable if i mean i don't know which part of the country elaine is in this is this is always one of the problems with answering questions mm. um that if if elaine is in the north of scotland then the advice would be somewhat different from if she was down in cornwall um but if the weather is good and the bees are flying as richard said his, his are um then you could make it into you know add some water and make it into a, a fairly um you know get the honey out of the wax sorry get the wax out of the honey and then feed them with it or you can spread the um, mixture out but make sure that they can get to it so you could use a something like a miller or an ashforth feeder without the um plate that that stops some bees coming up and drowning or feeding syrup so they can actually come up and climb over the barrier and get in among the honey and, and um, lick it up from there or um, a, a baking tray or something like that. You can spread it out on that. <clears throat> they, they can get up and get into that. Yeah. Well. As long as they can get up up into it, then... But I would spread yeah. it out. Otherwise, they tend to get themselves. If there's a mountain yeah. in it, they tend to attack it from the yeah. sides. And then the, you'll, you'll find a lot of them getting stuck. stuck yeah. the time. What you might actually get some wonderful comb, comb um, sculptures by the time they've finished with it. Well, yeah, that's true. Keep it yourself and make some need. Sorry? The other one is to keep it for yourself and make some need. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like, like meat. No, I, I like, I, but mind you, I never used to like honey, but now I love it, so maybe that will happen with mead as well. Um, okay, and the last 
no, I'll just continue reading from Elaine's questions. What's the latest point you can co you can combine bees from two hives for the winter? Ah, Wendy's back. Hi, Wendy. I can't hear you. Oh, you can't. Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Can't hear. I'll carry on read. <laughs> oh. Hey there, Wendy. Can you hear us, Wendy? Oh, no, she's having technical trouble, I think. I think she's muted. I'm just going to send her a quick chat. And then continue. I, think the, I think the question was, when is the latest time? That latest time that you hives? can unite hives, yes. Yeah, unfortunately, one hive has stopped laying completely as a result of the max strip varroa treatment and unsure whether to leave as is or combine with another hive. She says she knows she has to make sure that there's only one queen. I think it's okay. too late, to be honest, because, uh, well, again, it depends where she is, but bees in this area are beginning to start thinking about forming the winter cluster. You know, and I, I wouldn't, I don't think I would unite them. I would have done it sooner than this. You might get away with it. But uh, it's, it's difficult to tell, you know, um, depends on the colony size and all sorts of things as well. And what the weather's like where she is, because I'm, I, yeah. I am doing one at the moment. Yeah, I think we're on the edge of, of, of uniting. Mm. Yeah, it's still warm here, the bees are very active and what have you, so I thought I would try it. With this, with this, you know, yeah. Yeah, I think they've got to be, they've got to be active because you know you've got to get them moving through the the two boxes and combining mm. that way. Stevens and then put all the brood down in in the bottom box and the food above it for winter. Okay. And yeah, just to say, our, our deputy editor Stevens just confirmed that personally. He said um, he he wouldn't do it if the bees were flying strongly or if uh, forage was minimal. And again, it is dependent on, on environmental conditions as well. Um, sorry, Wendy. No, I was going to say that we've actually combined two today. Um, sorry, yesterday. Yeah. Um, and uh, today it was just been so warm. It's like it's been a midsummer's day here. So. Yeah. You know, it it does depend hugely on the temperature yeah. and what the bees are doing. Um, you know, basically, we were just trying to to rescue two hives that were struggling. So they either combine and try and make it through together, or they probably would not have um, would not make it through. Oh yeah, I mean, I I would fully support combining weak weak colonies together to make a strong wintering unit. But you, you've had a summer's day. We've it's been all right here, but it's I, I wouldn't have gone out in my shirt sleeves. <laughs> I can and, tell you, know, you I'm it, not was, that far north. it was absolutely baking. We were really pleased we only did one hive because it was it was just so yeah. hot. Yeah. So how are you doing that, Wendy? Were you shaking them in together or had you previously put one on top of another? Um one on top of another yeah newspaper combined and the queen was actually in the top box so uh, i don't know it was it was a real trial to just make sure you know to to give them at least a chance of getting through and obviously feeding them giving them good um good food uh, we've got rapid feeders which fill across the top of the hive and um we gave them a nice lot of syrup today so we'll just see how they how they get on loads of bees um thanks wendy and i think claire you just mentioned this um before the last part of elaine's question should you put the winter stores in the super above or below the brood box confused about what is best to do um but above is what i've always thought i i don't yeah you see my experience is that the winter cluster moves upwards mm -hmm. So why put food under their feet when they when they're going to climb the, climb up the hive? Um, I've never really understood why people want to put stores underneath because it's not where the bees would put them. In a natural nest, um, the stores are at the top, mm. and the bees move up because they've they've got a warm column of air rising from the cluster, and they they move up through it. 
Um, and you put a queen excluder in between. I, well, I, I would not put a queen excluder in between because there is a great danger that the queen, you know, as the cluster moves up, the queen's going to get left behind. Mm -hmm. So personally, I would not put an excluder on for wintering. Sort it out in the spring. If, if, you, if she's got up into the super, which she may well have done, then you can shake all the bees, every bee down into the bottom box, into the brood box, and then put your excluder on. And if there's brood in the super, the nurse bees will come up, and, they, and once that brood's hatched, you can then deal with that comb. Want it to use it for as a sort of half brood brood box. Um, you know, you can cut it out and put foundation in and, and whatever if you want to use it for honey storage or them to use it for honey storage, not you. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I, I have to say that we've we've had um, we've usually put the super on the top. And as Claire said, the bees will always go up, which yeah. means the following spring, um, we've used it as an opportunity to give them new foundation down in the brood box if the, the comb needs mm -hmm. to be replaced. So we've ended up with a brood and a half, but we've had the super sort of next year, if you like, we would have the super as at the bottom and then the new brood box on top. Um, so it's, it's a back to, back to front hive for that year but then the same thing happens again the following year they'll all go and move up into the brood box and you get back to the same you know brood at the bottom mm. and brood and a half it's not ideal but um yeah that's an interesting way of doing it yeah <laughs> <laughs> very very back to front but you know um, i just shake them all down and put the super back on top and tell them to get on with it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I think it depends what you find in it, really, doesn't it? Yeah. I think that's well, um, yeah, but yeah. I mean, we have run ours on brood and a half um, for quite a bit, but last year the was absolutely dreadful around here for honey. Um, so I've had to take their their honey stores, you know, the super that um, they would normally get for winter. I've had to nick some of those so that um, we get at least some honey this year. Mm. Um, so you know any any that haven't got enough um, stores well you know as i said earlier they've got honey down in the brood box um and we will feed them with candy if if necessary can, actually can i just ask a question as to um has is anybody finding that there is very little pollen around at this time of year i mean normally we would expect the the hives to have a certain amount of pollen in them. Some of them would be packed, but a lot of the hives that we've um, that we've been going into recently have had precious little in the way of pollen. I just wondered if it was pretty common. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean they should be getting pollen in for the ivy now. Have you got any water balsam near you? Any what? Because they'll collect it from oh, the Himalayan Himalayan balsam. balsam. No, not not this particular apiary. Because because they'll, they'll collect, they get pollen from that, don't they? Yes. Have you got ivy around nearby? No, not in, not in that particular apiary. No. I think... It's, it's very strange. It does vary from apiary to apiary, I have yeah. to say. Um, I think, just illustrates, yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I just, I just wondered. No, no, no. Was... Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Okay. Um, and thanks again, Elaine, for that question. And it's 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 great to kick us off um with all those questions and in answer to uh your request of putting titles in the previous um beecraft live webinars we'll do that as well with the with the theme of what each webinar is so then you can you can know which one to watch um okay so we have a question from stephen ellie or ely are bees are still flying, balsam and early ivy? Can we api guard treat and winter feed them at the same time in safety? Would you like to kick us off with that? Um, read the packet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I, to be honest, I don't know. Um, so I would read the Apigard box, the instructions, and if they're not clear, then drop a line to Vita Europe and ask them. I have, um, I have looked into this because I had... I had oh, that. right. Yeah, it, it, if I remember rightly, there isn't actually a problem with doing it. 
there isn't necessarily a reason why you shouldn't do it. Um, mm. but you can find, for example, that um, uh, if you're feeding at the same time as you've got Open Guardian, you may find that the bees concentrate on taking down all the syrup and not on um, removing the Open Guard gel and distributing it around the hive. So it could be uh, less effective. Um, and I've, I've actually found it goes both ways. I've found that sometimes um, when I've had the treatment on and feeding, they don't touch the syrup at all. Um, so I think every hive is different, as you know, every colony reacts in a different way. But I, I think essentially there isn't, um, there isn't actually a reason from the point of view of the efficacy of the treatment why you shouldn't mm. at the same time. It just depends how the bees react to it. Mm. Um, bees are very good actually at answering queries like that, and they do have a good. Um, frequently asked um, question section on their website, so it is often worth checking on to see what they have to say, I think it's probably updated quite regularly. Thank yeah. you. Okay, I hope that helps Stephen. Um, Mark from Norfolk, and I, I, this is probably quite apt because we've been talking a lot about the weather, uh, Mark asks, during a very heavy rain shower, when the weather minutes before has been warm and sunny, to such an extent that the bees are out foraging, how devastating can it be to a colony? And do foragers cope well when out in such conditions? Um, so is the, is, the what, question, is the question, are bees okay in the rain, flying in the rain? I think because we've had the, the weather <laughs> where it's sunny one minute, raining the next minute, and bees are caught in it when it's sort of, you know, how what effect is that on the hive? Can they get it back is what I'm taking from that, or do they? Eventually, they got their brollies with them, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they've got their no, baskets no. full. Um, I mean, I've, but I've thought that myself, and I'm quite grateful Mark asked that because you, you, the weather's just been crazy, and I do think of the bees that are just stuck out. But they, you know, they, you know, they seem to sense. Um, yeah. My my agree on a hill, mm -hmm. and often I'm there. I have no idea what weather is about to come over the hill, but I always know when it's about to rain because the bees all come rushing home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And they are, I think um, I read some research about um, the fact that bees are very sensitive to, I think, I suppose it's barometric pressure, even um, a day or two before big amounts of rainfall, and, and that they will um, forage a lot harder beforehand to see the sense it's coming. Mm, well, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Certainly It'll on be a scale, they will come scurrying back. I think the other thing is that actually we can't do anything about it. You know, if they get caught out in a shower, then they get caught out in a shower, and they've been doing it for a very, very long time and have survived. So um, I suspect that it's only if a bee actually gets hit by a raindrop that um, it's really going to be put off kilter. I mean, the the temperature drops, but if they're flying, they should be all right, shouldn't they? Would have thought. Oh, I thought so. So they wouldn't sort of sit and wait for the raid to stop, Claire, and then just go back to I, the high. Bar. I think that's very unlikely. <laughs> I've got this picture of them all waiting, door with <laughs> shop door window. <laughs> okay. Don't find them congregating under a tree. <laughs> um, okay, and I have another. I'll try and we're getting lots more questions that are coming in. So thanks everybody, and we'll try and sort of get through as many as we can. Um, if not, we'll answer them by email afterwards. Trudy Seglar, um, what is what is the panel's thoughts on reversing hive bodies? And I have to admit, as a beginner, I'm, I I don't actually know what that means. Rever reversing hive bodies. If it's, so, um, I'm not going anyone to, feel free. To, Fourteen by twelve, and it's not something that I I've ever done. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what she she means either. I I would have thought. Um, I would have thought she means the same about um, whether you super under or over. Um, as, yeah. as we were saying, the bees tend to go up in into the super and reversing hive bodies. I would assume that that's what she means by actually following year having the super as a brood box. So doing what you did. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Um, I think perhaps it's just using the swarm control. Mm. Well, perhaps Trudy can email us again with a, a little bit of an explanation. A little bit more information. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. yeah, I was just Link. thinking, I was going to suggest that. Okay. Thanks, Trudy. So, if, yeah, if you'd like to email through again, just to clarify, that would be really great. Um, Christina Bradley, I've got two, two parts to Christina's question. Um, the first part is making concentrated sugar syrup for winter feed, two to one. I've noticed it crystallizes at the bottom of the feeders. Whereas the invert stuff, sorry, I'm reading this word for word, you buy doesn't, even though it's quite thick. What actually is invert sugar? Please explain it in layman terms, not complicated words. And how can I see a simple, and how can I, as a simple beekeeper, make my own? One to one or two to one? Oh, have I read that okay? Yeah, sorry, yeah. I'm just having a look what. Wikipedia says about yeah. invert sugar syrup. And then there's a second part to Christina's question is, um, sorry, Richard, is adding vitamin C or lemon juice seems to be the agent changing the sugar syrup. Is this so the, the case? Part, what, what is inverted? What is inverted? You're very quiet, Richard. Oh. Yes. Yeah. What actually is in invert sugar? In, in well, that, the, 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 what bees do when they bring in, um, they bring in sucrose in the nectar which is a um, monosaccharide and they add um, the enzymes, which is um, Invertas, I believe, or Diastas, I think is the old name for it. Can you hear me right now? A bit better, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and then they turn that into a um, into disaccharide. So they split the sucrose up into um, uh, glucose and fructose. Um, so that's what the bees do. So if you, if you feed invert, uh, inverted sugar syrup, that um, process has already been done. It's, it, the sucrose has been split up into uh, glucose and fructose. So the idea is that the bees don't have to expend energy in um, processing it. But they will always, that will always happen as soon as a bee consumes uh, nectar. Um, you know, as it goes into them, the um, enzymes will be added and the um, that process of conversion will occur. Just, just had a look at Wikipedia on this. And it says, inverted sugar syrup can be easily made by adding water and roughly one gram of citric acid per kilogram of sugar, cream of tartar, one gram per kilogram, or fresh lemon juice, 10 milliliters per kilogram may also be used. Um, mixture is boiled to get to a temperature of 114 degrees centigrade and will convert enough of the sucrose to effectively pre prevent crystallization without giving a noticeably sour taste. Invert sugar syrup may also be produced without the use of acids or enzymes by thermal means alone. Two parts granulated sucrose and one part of water simmered for five to seven minutes will convert a modest portion to invert sugar. There you are. Wikipedia has spoken. Excellent. So it... it um, it appears that in fact it's the you know it's the addition of the acid that does prevent effectively present crystallization um, so if you want to make your own that's how you can do it but to be honest I've not really had any problems with um, bits of sugar left in the in the um, feeder I mean you always take them out and dissolve them and give them back again yeah Okay, thanks Claire, thanks for checking that, that's answered. That's right. I meant to do that before we started, sorry. That's okay. Um, and Roger Smart um, had a question which a couple of us have kind of answered already. Um, I've filtered my extracted honey three times and it's still not clear. Have you any solutions to clear the honey? Um, Claire, I'll go to you as well because you you did touch on this earlier when you mentioned it might be pollen that's yeah it, it could be it could be pollen it, i mean it depends what the what the honey is you know where it's come from um because it, it could be pollen which could be fine enough to pass through the filter that roger is using um or it could be micro crystals that haven't melted um and you know, if it's oilseed rape, then that's one of the you know a real possibility that it could be um, crystals. Um, depends how you've actually extracted it. It could even be fine bits of wax. Um, I think the best thing to do is to 
if you've done it three times that means you've warmed it up three times and that's really is not a good idea i would say just uh, give in and seed it with some fine crystallized honey and sell it as or use it as soft set honey I, I think if you try three times and it's still not clear I, I suspect that there's something there that isn't going to clear I have to say I've had for the first time I've had some um, some honey that actually extracted has pretty much gone into a, um, a soft set honey straight away and I think what's happened there is that the bees have initially in the spring have been on an oilseed rape uh, and they've actually if you like mixed a different honey in with it um to the point yep. that it's been able to be extracted um and you've just got a, a mixture of different um different honeys from oilseed rape and something else uh, which is really nice if the bees have actually done the mixing for you because oilseed rape can be an absolute pain and uh, I was when I looked at when I uncapped the frames, I was a little concerned because a particular apiary I knew had been fairly close to oilseed rape, um, having tried to avoid it like the plague. Um, but the it looked as if it was oilseed rape or potentially, but thin oilseed rape. So I think the bees did the job for me actually in um, in seeding it themselves, uh, and the honey seems fine. But it it is thicker and it is um, it's not not as clear as um, one normally expects honey to be. Has has it set since it's, you extracted it? Yeah, it's setting it's set very quickly. It's set in fact some of it I actually left in the extractor and it's set in the extractor. So. Um, right. Yeah, so I had great fun getting that out. But um, and and can you get it out of the jars? I mean, is it is it soft set or has it gone hard? Um, it's a, well, I've only just done it, Claire. To be honest, oh, and right. it, it's, okay. at the moment, I think it's still soft set mm. um, because okay. if I've when I've had oilseed rape before that I've managed to extract, um, it has gone rock hard in the buckets. But when it yeah. went, um, it went just went soft set in the extractor. So I think it's you know it is a um, just a mix. But also you know it could well be pollen. Mm. Um, you might find it beneficial if you've got a, a a bucket of this of your honey that to stir it round before it sets, just to break up the the crystallisation a bit. Right. It might not. That might keep it as soft set as opposed to going rock hard. Right. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well. You, you say you try to avoid oilseed rape. We 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 couldn't do without oilseed rape around here. Oh, <laughs> it's been of my life actually. But um, we we moved the hives to try and avoid it, um, and actually moved them to within about half a mile of uh, a new oilseed rape field. So <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do, you can't win, can you? <laughs> the bees will fly there anyway. <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah, that's it. We have uh, we have rape flowering now. First time. Have you? Oh, yeah. wow! Yeah. Is it is it um, rogue obviously rape or is it wind, um, spring sun, spring sown? It's a field that's been left fallow. It's only one field, uh, a big field, about twenty or twenty five acres, I think. Yeah. It was left fallow, but I think as you say, it's very rogue. But it's 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 a very heavy field, yeah. and I think every bee in North Wiltshire's made it quite there. <laughs> Winter, Richard. <laughs> Richard, just to um, I think a, a few people have emailed just to say that you are quite quiet. So I, I just um, the rest of us, if we make sure we mute when Richard um, talks, and maybe if you can just lean really close. <laughs> I don't know. Right, I'm, I'm, I've got a very wide desk. Which is shout. But yeah, <laughs> no, just to be a few people said they find it quite difficult to hear. So right, just I'll thought I'd you. mention that. Thank yeah. you. Okay, just shout. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Martin, who's two questions. He says, I've noticed on one of my hives that a fistful of bees are clinging to the underside of the open mesh floor. Any known reason for this? Secondly, when I take the roof off, some hives rough sorry. Secondly, when I take the roof off some hives, dozens of earwigs scurry away. Is there any way to stop this or doesn't it matter? To be honest, I don't think the earwigs matter at all. I mean, they're they're just looking for somewhere nice and warm to cuddle up. Um, yeah. I, I don't think they're going to do any any problem cause any problems to the bees at all. Okay. 
but that's that's just me. I don't know about um, anybody else's experience with earwigs. Yeah. It's big spiders, but not earwigs. Yeah. It's, the, it's the big spiders I can't handle. But, uh, <laughs> that comes part of beekeeping, I think. Um, bit, I have to say, the earwigs do like the polystyrene hives. Ah, uh, we do, right. We do get a, quite a few of those around the the um, just underneath the roof. Um, yeah. Not yeah, often. but they don't they don't damage them, do they? No, don't no, they don't. No, no, they, no. Just, as you say, Claire, they've just gone there for some somewhere warm to be. Yeah. Um, they're just not very nice things, but there you go. They don't actually get inside the hive. Um, not that I'm aware of, no. No, well, certainly they, they don't on mine. They're just around no. underside the, the roof because there's a little ridge on the polystyrene hive, so um, they just stay with it outside the ridge. Um, and I have to say, Martin, I, I've seen these uh, fistful of bees clinging under the, uh, under the open mesh floor. Um, I don't know why that is either. Um, I've just assumed that they've gone out and they've not quite sure of their way back in. Uh, and obviously they're, getting, they're still getting the, the smell of the pheromone through from the queen through the open mesh floor, I would think. Mm. So they know that that's where they're supposed to be, but I don't know. No I idea. Know. Interesting to see if Martin's got poly hives as well, actually, if he's having similar issues to you, Wendy. Um, yeah, okay. I, I don't know what what the answer to that is. I think I'd be a bit concerned if the bees were hanging out at this time of year. Well, it's just a, a fistful of bees clinging to the underside. Do they go back in after you know when it goes when it cools down? If that's if they go back in, then there's no problem at all. They're just doing what yeah. they want to do. Martin, yeah. it doesn't actually say, but Martin, if you'd like to come back and give us more information, then we might be able to. Somebody. Else? I mean, I've, I've I've seen them doing that hanging underneath when it's really hot, and that's because it's just too hot inside, and they've come out to cool off. Yeah. I mean, but I wouldn't expect that this time of year. Well, we've had a, a, another email from Linda Hunt about this, actually, saying that her hive has a massive number of bees clustering outside the hive on warm days. The bees are also not taking down the sugar syrup very quickly, but they have been busy bringing forage into the hive. It must be in North Wiltshire, I think, out on the oilseed, <laughs> your oilseed rate, Richard. Um, does this mean the hive is over-congested and will it settle down? Well, I think she needs to heft the hive to find out how heavy it is. And if it feels as though it's nailed to the floor, to the stand rather, then um, they're full. Yeah. You know, as far as taking down the, the syrup is concerned. Yes, I wouldn't be um, too perturbed about that, but I, I'd just be just a little concerned perhaps about whether the hive's over congested or they, can a hive be over congested at this time of year? I don't know. I, I would have said that they would have cuddled up and clustered and and reduced, you know, packed everybody in. Yeah. And have you ever known it them doing that, Richard? No, not at this time of year. Can you hear me okay? I've just been fiddling with my yeah, setting. That's better. That's okay. better, yeah. Okay. Turn uh, the volume up. That, it, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a bit of background <laughs> noise. It sounds a little bit like an aeroplane taking off as well, but I can hear you. That's right, we can cope with this aeroplane. It could be an extractor running, of course. So, uh, no, I haven't experienced it this time of year, and I wouldn't, I don't know why they wouldn't be in there. I mean, they always seem to be able to make room for themselves. Um, it's, especially this time of year, it's a very populous colony. I mean, I think that's quite good news. If you've got lots of bees, that's good. Yeah. Um, the only time, I, I mean, I have had them cleaning underneath when I, unknown to me i've made a mess of something and the queen has ended up on the underside of the floor ah yes right. well that's a different story <laughs> yes it's another story that's not that's not so much <laughs> let's not go there <laughs> yeah. okay thank you wendy for reading that question out um right. just check i'm not on mute nope i'm here Okay, Kevin, here in southwest France, the local beekeepers laugh at us mixing up different concentrations of sugar syrup for autumn versus spring feeding. So is there really any need for two different types of sugar strengths? Factored syrup here is just the same one-to-one -one concentration, give or take. Anyone? Well, bees can cope with the 
nectar concentrations from very weak to very strong and they will cope with one to one sugar two to one sugar whatever um, but my understanding is that when you're feeding for winter the, the stronger solution is so that it takes them less effort and energy to actually evaporate off the water before they can store it so in other words they do the minimum amount of work before they get the um, they get the syrup into the into the cells and and ready for winter um, because if you feed if you've got a very small colony and if you feed it too much you can actually wear the bees out and give them less chance of surviving than they would have had normally which is why you know we, we tend to say right you know uh, strong syrup for the winter um, and in the in the spring they also need some water to dilute stores so that's the reason for giving the one-to-one -one. Um, but the bees will cope it doesn't matter in well in one sense well, I, I find I, I do believe that um, a weaker syrup which is closer to what you're more like to find in nectar um, does help in the spring to encourage them uh, to, to build more brood as opposed to keeping by storing it uh, and a weaker solution seems in my experience to encourage um, quack building yeah well they, they you know they, they're getting the water from it as well as the as the sugar out of it so you know and in the spring they need water um, but for the winter feed they you know they, they're trying to get rid of the water if you like Richard um, can you mute Yeah, so if someone's machine is doing updates, it'd be great if you could mute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> ah, <it's nice. laughs> Quiet. And I can't hear him. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I, I mean, I think... I, I mean, personally, I absolutely hate sugar syrup. I always get it wrong. I got it wrong in the article, as anybody who's read it will will realise. There's an apology in the in the October issue. Um, equal parts of sugar and syrup are not two to one. Uh, anybody with any brain would know that, but there we are. Um, my <laughs> brain sometimes goes on holiday, um, and that was proofread as well. So <laughs> it went past several of us. But that's that's how it goes. Um, but you know, um, I'd really, you know, I just, as I say, I hate, I hate it. And um, making it up, as I describe in the article, is just so much easier than weighing stuff out and measuring volumes of this. And you know, a pound to a pint was lovely. And then they went metric, and it was a, it was something like a kilo to six hundred and eighty liters or something. I don't take those those figures as right because they're no doubt wrong um but you know it's just so complicated and everybody gets hung up about oh it's got to be 680 it mustn't be 682 milliliters the bees don't care you know another bit of extra water and they'll just they'll evaporate it off you know um you're just giving them a bit more extra work to do that's all so it really is not syrup is not an exact science well not in my opinion anyway Mm -hmm. well, I have to say that I never ever made sugar syrup myself. I've always used ambrosia. Um, yeah, well, that's the other way of doing it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's one of the reasons we started leaving honey on the hive, so I didn't have to mm. make syrup. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, the kitchen floor is stickier at syrup making time than it is at honey extracting time. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, we did have another question in from Glenn uh, asking why do bees cluster underneath the mesh floor? Um, will they return to the hive? And Glenn, hopefully, question we've answered that for you, but please get in touch if, you, um, if you've got any more queries with regards to that. Um, Sean has asked, is there any benefit to keeping rapeseed supers that have set for use as feed in the winter, or is it too costly to the bees in energy terms? Oops, sorry, can, can I just clarify that? Saving yeah, so super soil seed rape to feed in the winter. Yeah, is is it is it worth it? Is it too much to ask of the bees to kind of break down the the oil seed rape um, honey? Is it worthwhile? Uh, well, by the winter it will set solid. Yeah. So 
they yeah. have to do an awful lot of work because they're going to have to dilute it. The only time I um, and then transport it and then evaporate it off again. <clears throat> the only time I'd willing. Richard. I was going to say the only time I'd willingly give it to them because I want I want to give them some food, and I've got something like that, that I want them to use would be in the spring, um, when they're more capable of getting out and bringing in plenty of water and, and so forth. Um, but I wouldn't give it to them over the winter if I had a choice. I mean, it, it's the same thing as, as ivy honey going solid. Um, and like you're feeding at the same time as they're, they're collecting ivy honey so that you don't get the solid ivy honey, which co can cause problems. Um, I mean, my, my husband's certainly been given some honey out of a, a dead bee's crop, which was ivy honey. And they, the, this colony, as I understand it, had filled up every cell in the, in the hive that they could. Do. So the, the bees had got the ivy honey in their crops because they hadn't got anywhere else to put it, and it solidified and it killed them. Wow. The, something I would say about that is if they, the bees have collected um, ivy honey, that if you heft the hive, um, and not realize that the, it's mainly ivy honey, then your bees may not have as much in the way of food as you think they have. So if you know you've got a lot of ivy around and they're likely to have collected a lot of that, then you know just be wary that um, even if the hive is quite, he quite heavy when you heft it, uh, it may not be food that the bees can actually eat. Mm. Yeah, until till the spring when they can get the water to to, to dilute it. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm concerned yeah. more sort of the oh, when yeah, oh well, yeah, absolutely. No, I'm I mean I think you're you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's go to David Tomlis Tomlinson, and he says I have two hives, one small and one large, both from swarms uh, in the summer. He's in Eastern England and asks. Shall I combine them to make one safe hive to continue through the winter? One of them is flying vigorously and the other, the smaller one, minimally. So two hives, one big, one small, one vigorous, one not so vigorous. And, and should he, he's in Eastern England, and should he combine them? It's quite noisy. Oh, thanks Richard. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think we've, we've sort of touched on this before um, earlier on. I mean, it depends. This is this is one of the biggest problems with trying to answer questions like this. Um, we know that this is the east of England, so we know roughly yeah. the sort of climate and everything. But you know, so so often I want to say, well, let me come and have a look, and then I'll tell you what to do, yeah. um, because it depends on how big the small colony is. I mean, if it's really small, then Yes, unite it. In fact, I think I would probably say unite it anyway. You know, if you because the best packing for bees over winter is bees. So the, the stronger the colony, the better they're going to be able to um, come through. Okay. Thank so I mean, on on the ev on the information that we've got, my recommendation would be, in fact, to combine them. Mm. But you know, get rid of one of the queens mm -hmm. first. Yeah, Richard, is that what you'd advise as well? well? Um, I would have a look inside the smaller colony. I don't know if it's in the new or what have you, um, and really just see how small it is. Because you know, sometimes that second small colony can make it through the winter. If you think the other one can do without it, um, you know, that second small colony might be the one that survives and gives you a queen in the spring if you have problems with the other one. If you have only got two and you combine them into one, then you know you are taking the risk that you don't have that something to fall back on. True, but a strong colony is more, like a, a healthy strong colony, let's let's put this one in, because that is a vital part of the equation as well. Uh, a healthy strong colony is, is more likely to survive than a healthy little one. Um, but, you know, as Richard said, it, it depends on how big it is and what sort of stores it's got, what sort of brood it's got. Uh, how vigorously she's laying. I mean, is it an old queen that's swarmed that you've picked up or is it a new virgin queen? Um, one question would be is if they both were swarms in the summer, why are they not both the same size? So has it got no sema, um, for instance, which has prevented it from building up like it should do? Um, have a and look and see. 
and then you know it, I'm sorry but it's down it's your decision um, if you think it's going to make it and you you want your two colonies in the spring then leave it uh, if you think it probably isn't going to make it then unite it and you can always split them up in the spring to make two two colonies okay thank you uh, we've just Martin's just come back to us as well saying that the, the cluster of bees the fistful of bees that are uh, um, underneath the mesh floor has been, been there for two weeks he doesn't know if they're the same bunch though but that's that seems quite a long time for the bees to be collecting there um, he doesn't specify if they go in um, at into the hive at any point um, I'm not sure. they could actually there could be a problem perhaps with the open mesh floor and uh, simply because um, the on the polystyrene hives you screw them pretty much in each four corners or perhaps an extra one on the sides being a Langstroth um, but if there is the slightest gap then bees can get in and out through the open mesh floor as opposed at the side as opposed to actually going in and out of the front so it could be that they're just hanging around you know on their way in or on their way out um, if they found a, another way in. So they're using it as an entrance you mean? Yes mm. yes. Yeah but it, I wouldn't expect a cluster at the entrance though no Not this time of year i think if on a good on a nice warm day i think i would go and investigate and sort of take the hive apart and, and knock all the bees inside and put it back together again and you know because if the queen is under there which could could have happened i mean we don't know what how the hive's been manipulated um but if the queen is under there then you want her inside and mm. if you knock all the bees inside into the brood box and put it all back together again if they then go and cluster under the floor again then it's obviously what they want to do <laughs> don't ask me why <laughs> thanks martin for coming back to us um with that, that helps I'm sorry. <laughs> um okay we've got a couple of minutes left julia in worcestershire she says that she today um, looked to looked about in, insulating hives, and from what I understand, that she's insulating her hives with a black pond liner. Is this, or, or she's been advised to, is that recommended? Uh, where is she insulating it? I mean, is this just on top of the cover board, or the inner cover, or the crown board, or whatever you want to call it? Um, she doesn't say actually, Claire. Just. Um, just today, I saw about insulating hives with the black pond liner. Um, is this recommended? So I don't have any more detail other than it. So maybe she's thinking about wrapping it around the hive, mm. in large, uh, like that. Um, well, that's, yeah. that's how I took it. Um, but yeah. yeah. I thought people with wooden hives tended to use polystyrene to actually wrap around the hives uh, for insulation in the winter that's why i never understood why people have wooden hives when they could buy polystyrene ones but claire, dis claire I and i disagree on this one my hives up <laughs> <laughs> and they survive on their own thank you yeah, i have wooden all my hives are wooden i don't wrap them up but i do put something above uh, above the crown board yeah we we used to we got a whole load of polystyrene and cut it all up and, and put it under the you know uh, over the crown board under the roof um i'm not convinced that it made much difference it ought to but um and i've, I've read something recently that to use um oh it's yeah it was in your article in the, in october richard the beginner's article sorry um that richard typeset um malcolm clark recommends using the silver you know that building stuff that's polystyrene with silver on both foil on both sides Teletext. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, right. So, yeah. Yeah, that's what I use, um, and I find it very useful. I mean, it, who's to say how much difference it makes? But when you lift a sheet of that up um, midwinter, if you're having a quick peek, the heat underneath it is incredible, and that's heat that would be going up and out otherwise. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I can see you know the benefits of of um, putting polystyrene or whatever insulation over the top of the ground board um but this she's in worcestershire you say 
that's right yeah, yeah if she so, was in the north of scotland then i i would say yes you know you could think about wrapping colonies up outside but yeah. i don't know how much insulation a rubber pond liner would give i have no idea mm -hmm. i didn't think, never had any experience of one i didn't think they were flexible anyway to be honest well if it's like I, I, rubber i mean i think i don't i think you're right there i don't think it would offer very much insulation not unless you're packing something else in between it but i think all you'd be doing is um making it perhaps a little bit more waterproof but that's yeah. not necessary um if anything you might be preventing the walls of the hive from breathing and, and yeah. causing um damp yeah mm. which is far worse than, than issues with cold yes yes damps the killer not the cold okay so Thank you. all in all we don't quite understand what you want to do with the with the rubber pond liner but we think it's probably not a good idea and there are better alternatives Thank you, everybody. Um, we've, we've still got streams of questions coming in, but we've, our hour has come to an end. Um, thanks. I've got a question from John Hallward and Amanda, Jem and Mel and Jill. We'll all um, email um, with, our, with our questions, if that's okay with the panel. And yeah. unless there's any, anything else anyone wants to add um, before we leave? What's, what's the date of the next hangout there? The next hangout day is oh that's you caught me now, Richard. <laughs> well, while you're looking for that, um Claire, I'll just say that we've had a, a an email in from um Kevin out in France and uh, he's just says some of the panel answers are assume that bees always go upwards they don't some of us use warre and long bar hives so it might be worth mentioning there are other philosophies that observe different behaviors and so you can't always put a super on top and feed um and also putting another box underneath is called nadiring i think but definitely not supering no he's, he's right it is nadiring and yes apologies kevin that we um we were just fix, fixed on um, the ordinary traditional national Langstroth whatever hive. Um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right that in, in a top bar hive or a long hive, then the bees are, are not going to move upwards because they can't. Well, you could put a, a super on, I think, but um, it, it is different. So, yes, all those, um, the answers that we gave to that refer to um, the traditional box hives. Thanks. Um, and the next Beecraft live event is on Thursday, the 12th of October, um, for everybody. And just to mention again that uh, Claire's article on feeding is in September's issue of Beecraft, and October's issue that's just come through. Claire's also written an article on preparing for winter. So if you're not subscribed, then now's a good opportunity for you to do so. So thank you very much. I think that's it. Wendy, unless there's anything else you think we need to address, but the rest of the questions that have come through, we'll, we'll get to people. Um, everyone's sent so many questions in. Thank you. Yes, brilliant. Yep. Well, we'll see, see everybody you. next time. Yeah, 12th of October. Thank you. Okay. See you then. Bye. 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 Bye.